Hello, today is Thursday, July 7th, 2022. I'm Joe Schmidt from TC2, and this is Staying Connected. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Ben Fox, one of TC2's managing directors. And we are going to talk about negotiating customized IT services deals. We've seen a huge growth in these services over the last couple of years. So our clients and colleagues have been spending a lot more time developing and negotiating these kinds of service arrangements. What we're going to share is some of our insights. Hey, Ben, thanks for joining me to talk about this and welcome back to Staying Connected. Hi, Joe. Yes, nice to talk to you again. It's been a few months, I think, since our last one of these. So, Ben, why don't we start by talking about the growth and trends we've seen with customized IT services deals? Certainly. I think the trend we're seeing is simply that large enterprises are increasingly turning to global systems integrators, outsourcers, and professional services firms to deliver their IT functions and to deliver strategic projects. So it's a combination, if you will, of traditional IT outsourcing, but also combined with turning to these firms to staff and deliver really large and transformational IT programs. You know, that could be anything from a network transformation project to refreshing and upgrading users' computers, say, to even wholesale migration of applications to the cloud. And so, Joe, we can see this growth, actually, in the recent financial results from these large systems integrators in particular. So, for example, let me just consult my notes here. Yes, Accenture had 20% revenue growth in its Q2 financial year 2022 results. Wipro had 27.5% year-over-year growth in the last quarter of 2021. And Infosys cited $2.6 billion in large deal signings in its Q1 2022 results. And finally, TCS had 16.8% revenue growth in its last financial year. Hmm. Those figures certainly support our view about the growth that we're seeing. And of course, that growth means that there are a lot of deals and contracts being negotiated for these types of services. So Ben, what would you say are some of the important considerations for these kinds of deals? Well, I would say that by far the most important thing to bear in mind is that, you know, almost everything is completely custom in these deals. It's not like doing a deal for software or for cloud services or for network circuits, where the service provider will have a standard set of pricing and service descriptions and a standard set of contract documents that you kind of have to start your negotiation from. You know, these service providers, they'll certainly be able to provide their proposed deal structures and pricing constructs and that kind of thing. But really, the customer should expect to play a real lead role in developing the deal and the pricing structure that will best deliver and that best underwrites the business outcomes and the objectives that the customer is seeking. So good example, we do a lot of work helping customers negotiating these very large IT transformation projects. And the default service provider proposal is really just a price for a team of people for the period of time that they think it's necessary to get the work done. So in reality, that's really just a T&M project, a time and materials project, even if it's not advertised as one. So a major part of these types of negotiations is to convert the price from a kind of pseudo T&M model to an outcome or deliverable based pricing model. And the customer will have to lead that effort. And that includes defining the deliverables, defining the outcomes that pricing and payments will all be tied to. And you can definitely expect a, a really quite robust negotiation regarding the conditions and the circumstances under which a service provider will be able to charge additional fees. So, for example, if a customer causes a project to be delayed, that's normally a circumstance when the service provider would have certain rights to charge more money. Hey, so that last point about additional fees, that's a good one. So how can customers protect themselves and well, not overpay for those types of fees? So there's something called a quote unquote sweeps clause that can help. And a sweeps clause is a contract clause that essentially states that the fees and the pricing include everything inherently necessary to deliver the services, even if the contract does not explicitly state that something, a task or a responsibility is included. And really, the objective is to make sure that your statement of work or your services description doesn't lead to list every tiny little discrete task or function and to protect from the service provider claiming later that you know a task or certain work is out of scope, even when a reasonable person would, of course, expect that work to be in scope based on the overall project being delivered. And actually, it's interesting, service providers' starting points are often the exact opposite in that they would want that anything not expressly captured in the contract as a responsibility or task would be subject to additional fees. So our position in that negotiation tends to be that the service provider is the expert 
the customer can't be expected to identify every little task necessary to get the work done. That's why we're outsourcing this work. So really, the service provider should be required to proactively identify anything that is not included in the scope of the fees. But I will say that those kind of sweeps clauses, they're a backup protection, really. The best protection is, of course, to have a comprehensive and a well-drafted scope of work in the first place to avoid any gaps. And then the other area to look out for, which comes up a lot, is endless assumptions and customer responsibilities that the service provider presents in the contract documents. And assumptions and customer responsibilities are really just another method that the service provider uses to protect themselves and to leverage later potentially to require additional fees if such assumptions are shown to be incorrect or if the customer responsibilities aren't kind of completely fulfilled kind of ridiculous, but we've seen statements of work from service providers that have more content on the customer responsibilities than they have content covering what the service provider will do. So definitely be prepared to negotiate really carefully through such content. And in particular, to really focus on making sure that all the assumptions, all the customer responsibilities are really precisely and narrowly defined. Hey, on a previous podcast that you and I recorded, I think it was last summer, We talked about managed services and outsourcing SLAs. What can enterprises expect service levels to look like for these large IT delivery projects that you've been talking about? Yeah, right. So service levels for IT outsourcing are obviously a foundational part of the service. But service levels do certainly also have a role to play for these kind of large delivery projects. And the most common service level metrics tend to focus on on on-time delivery of key project milestones. But also delivery quality metrics can also be very useful. For example, metrics around successful cutovers first time without any backouts. For example, metrics that cover the fact that there's no defects found later on after the migration of whatever is being migrated. I think I'd also say that sometimes the most effective incentive to make sure that a large project is delivered as expected is simply to make sure that the pricing and the payment structure incentivizes on-time delivery and high-quality delivery. So, for example, tying payments of fees to milestones rather than just a monthly fee can be equally effective as having an on-time delivery SLA. So the fact is that the most expensive issue for a service provider is when a fixed price project overruns. So with the right fixed pricing structure and the right customer acceptance rights, a service provider is already highly incentivized to deliver the project on time and with a necessary level of quality. And by the way, Joe, the other thing I would say to make sure is covered off is the right to terminate a project for convenience. Yeah, that's always the ultimate recourse if things are not going well. And having the right to terminate for convenience, if you need to use it, can also help to keep the delivery quality high and on time. And for these kind of delivery projects, in most cases, there shouldn't be early termination fees and termination for convenience of a project. There should really only be a fairly modest notice period. You said earlier that because everything is so customized for these deals that the service providers, they don't tend to have a standard set of form contract documents that they use. So that must present challenges in putting together a robust contract schedule for these services, things like pricing schedules, service level attachments, and statements of work. Yes, Joe, that is certainly very true. And of course, it's the nature of the beast, really. You can't have standard contract documents for something that's custom made. And unfortunately, I think to further add to the problem, we found that the service providers are just unfortunately not that good at drafting the documents you're referring to. So too often it ends up falling on the service provider's sales team and the delivery team to draft those kinds of contract attachments. And bluntly, that's just not what these teams are good at or trained for. So really the only way to guarantee contract documents that robustly and precisely and comprehensively address pricing and scope of work and service levels you know, is for the customer to take on that burden for themselves. And I will say, of course, that's a lot of what TC2 does for our clients with lots of support, of course, from our friends at LB3. Ben, I'm curious, as you know, so working from customer drafted contract documents, as you just suggested, how does that tend to go down with the service providers? Well, I think in my experience, the service provider folks, they might bristle a bit when you take over the drafting, but I think you can push through that. They get over it, especially when they realize that your interest is really in high quality contract documents because the service provider recognizes that that's a benefit for everyone in the long run. And I think at some point there's a relief that they're not having to do the drafting and somebody else is. I also say that these kind of service providers that we're talking about in this space, they tend to be very collaborative. They tend to approach negotiations with a kind of problem solving approach, which is good. They're not just focused on their standard clauses and a approaches that they want to include in the contract. So I think perhaps sometimes they get a little defensive or sensitive when they feel you're focused on the contract and perhaps not willing to simply rely on their quote unquote relationship 
I do think sometimes that's the service provider's default defence when the contract negotiations start to get trickier. You know, Joe, that the line, if you will, that, quote, we'll just use our relationship to work that out if we ever come to it, rather than addressing such things up front in the contract. And obviously, we prefer to address as much as possible in the contract and not kick those thorny issues down the road and hope to work it out later. Okay, thank you, Ben. Does sound like this will be an area where we'll be helping our clients more and more and no doubt discussing it more frequently here on Staying Connected. Now, if you would like to learn more about custom IT services deals, or if you'd like to discuss other ICT needs with Ben, me, or any of our LB3 and TC2 colleagues, please give us a call or drop us an email. You can also stay current by subscribing to these Staying Connected podcasts by checking out our websites and by following us on LinkedIn.